joining me in the Zoom Zoom room right here with four conversations with the cultured athlete, we have the man, the legend, ladies and gentlemen, ah. Henry Burris in the house. I'm your, you're a CFL legend. You are a football legend, period. You are a TV legend. Now, Henry Burris, you're, you're in the house right now, man. I'm honored to have you on conversation with the cultured athlete, man. I can't, hear, I can't wait to hear what you have to say and drop gems for us, man. How you doing? Hey, doing great. You know, spending time with the family during this crazy time. Not, yeah. I mean, it's a time that not many of us would have expected. If you'd have told me that this would have happened in our lifetime, oh. you know, I'd have said, okay, what movie are we talking about here? But this is actually our reality. But, you know, to have a chance to sit down and talk with you, B. London, I'm, yeah. I'm excited, man. It's good, great to see you doing your thing, brother. Man, I'm all about, like, brands, you know, us athletes, brands. And you are a big brand, not, on, not only on the field, you play big games. You have a big brand off the field as well. So, I mean, you're someone that a guy like me was looking up to not only while I was playing, but even after because you crossed over. You, you like the Michael Strahan up there, man. <laughs> 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 up, in, up, in, up in Canada, man. So, uh, yeah, let's, let's, get straight, let's get straight into this. Um, I mean, obviously, like I said, anyone who's played in CFL, anyone who knows football, know who Henry Burris is. But the people out there who – kind of joining this podcast to know that I even played football. I mean, know me from uh, Daily Blast Live. And, and you were good, too. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, was, I, was, I was all right. You know, I was all right. Just, just get you, introduce yourself, man. Kind of tell the people a little bit about yourself. Well, uh, of course, my name is Henry Burris. I played 20, 20 years of professional football as a quarterback, wow. uh, threw for over 63,000 yards, uh, won mm. three Grey Cup championships, and, and you know, had a – you know, experience a fabulous journey. But again, for me, it was a journey where you know, I'm pretty sure a lot of Chicago Bear fans, a lot of Green Bay Packer fans, uh, you know, yeah. know who I am whenever I head back into the States and go to see family and revisit old friends. And, and you know what, for me, it was, it was to me that, 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 that transformation that took place during that time, going from a boy to becoming a man and yeah. understanding what it would take for me to achieve success as far as in that chapter of life called football. But you know what? I mean, when I came back to Canada, I played an additional 17 years, uh, won a couple of different great cups during that that tenure and was able to achieve some of my life's dreams as far as in what sports could deliver. And that was, to me, that Mission Impossible moment uh, where, you know, events where people said that you couldn't pull it off and you were able to do that. And it capped it off by in three years, helping turn an expansion program around here in Ottawa, the Red Blacks. Uh, in our second and third year of existence, going to the Grey Cup, losing in year two to Edmonton, mm -hmm. and then in year three, winning the Grey Cup over the Calgary St. Peters. But, mm -hmm. you know, for me, throughout my entire journey, my dad always told me, never be a one-trick pony. And the fact that I focused in on other things that I had a passion for, which was speaking, uh, being on TV, you know, that's where I earned my degree at Temple University, woo woo. But, uh, <laughs> you know, making sure, uh, you know, I use the degree that I learned um, to to benefit me later in life and help create that bridge in life. And for the last 13 years of my career, every off season, I worked with the media outlet, despite if it was radio or if it was with television, but my main focus was morning TV. And of course, once I finished, I retired. We won a great cup at the age of 41 years old, mm -hmm. still the oldest in, in, in football. Yep. And uh, when that happened, I bridged into becoming a morning show host and working with TS in Canada, which is the ESPN equivalent of it here yep. in Canada and uh, hosting, uh, you know, being co-host and also with a panel and, and an analyst uh, for football up here in the Canadian Football League and also breaking down NFL games. Man, luckily, this is just like an online web series thing because after all those accolades, we would have had a good commercial right there. That's, yeah. a, whole, that's a whole A block within itself, just full of accolades, man. I, I mean, I mean it's, it's, it's impressive, though. You know, it's, it's impressive. I went and uh, read up on you because I, I knew you from, you know, playing football with you, talking to you, but I didn't really, like, really know that you were from uh, a small town in Oklahoma with 2,000 people there. In high school, you used to play in front of, Crowds of like five, six thousand. That's 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 a big game right there, yeah. you know, in front of those type of crowds in high school. So, can you say your 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 humble beginnings, your upbringing, got you ready for big moments, and not only on the field but in life? Well, I was thankful for where I grew up because I was pretty much born in a place where the first question they ask is, "What position is your son going to play on the local football team at wow. Spiral High School?" And I know from that transition, growing up with that atmosphere and just being in that type of culture, it allowed me to, you know, 
kind of developed that intensity or that passion for the game of football and really whatever it took in life to help make yourself successful and seek out your passions. But being a, being a farm boy, growing up on a farm, taking care of, you know, uh, animals, farm animals day in and day out yeah. and being there with my father, who of course served in Vietnam. And once he came back from Vietnam, he wanted to, uh, you know, achieve his dream of playing uh, baseball in the major leagues, but because wow. of the color of his skin, he didn't have the opportunity or wasn't given the opportunity to fulfill that dream and fulfill his true destiny. And so I think just understanding the obstacles that, you know, I was faced with playing quarterback, you know, in the eighties and into the nineties, uh, you know, I was provided that resilient, I guess, trait that a lot of people just, you know, it, it's hard to obtain, but thankfully for my father, he gave that to me. And, and for so many people who said I couldn't do it even when I was growing up because they said I wasn't fast enough. They said I wasn't this enough. I wasn't tall enough. I didn't have this or with that. Just knowing that when people said I couldn't, it only built that fire in me that much more. Uh, because, you know, whenever you put a, a mountain in front of me, I'm like, how many days are you giving me to overclimb that mountain? Yeah. And I'm going to make that happen. And regardless if I have equipment or not, I know I have the people around me that are going to help get me there and reach the pinnacle, but also make it to the other side. And so I, I think that's just been in my veins, man. And it's still pumping today. And now with this crisis, I'm trying to figure out how can I find ways to create new content and change the narrative. Let's get to it. <laughs> isn't, it isn't it crazy? Like how we just, we are where we are, like our up, our upbringing, like the things that our parents put in is because, you know, I remember the days where, you know, my father, football coach, you know, he was on the up and up. He would wake me and my older brother up at like, four, I mean, five, six in the morning on weekends, bring us into the, the facility, work out with us. And then while he's doing extra in terms of breaking down film, recruiting and all, he used to have that, have us right there with us. So you got to see, like you said, that resiliency, that, that, that hard work. And then it just, it just travels with you for the rest of your life. I mean, it's like, it's instilled in us. It's crazy. Uh, it's amazing. And some, and, and those types of traits are transferable on so many different levels. Mm. And, and, you know, for me to be able to play 20 years in, in, in professional mm. football, I mean, it's unheard of. And, and, you know, I look at some of the all time greats and one thing that you always see that they all have as far as you know, when you, when you talk about things that guys share traits that you see guys that they carry is that toughness, that tenacity, but you always know the work ethic is there. And it always talks about work. And when you ever hear stories from the great players in the NFL now, like Aaron Donald down to, of course, Peyton Manning, Tom Brady, even to guys like Russell Wilson, you always hear about the work ethic. And they had people that were always pushing them. And whenever we tried to hit the pause button, people would kick our butts and hit the play button and say, get your butt out there, get out of the house. You don't need to be playing video games, get outside. Get outside. And you know what? I mean, and those, those lessons that we learned as kids, I mean, now with me, I'm, I'm about to turn 45 in just over a month. I mean, those lessons still stick to me. And, and you know what? And it's in my mind. Whenever I sit down and watch a movie, I'm antsy to get up and continue to work. But you know what? I mean, those are the things that are instilled in us. And it's very important factors to have and very important features to have. Because, again, the hard work that you put in, all the success that you're able to achieve and all the benefits that you're able to achieve, to me, that's just the result of the hard work that you put in and the focus that you're able to get. Yeah, man. Oh, got these gems early this early today, too, man, man. Um, so I want to talk about, you, you mentioned how you played 20 years, 20 years professional football. It's 20 years with that, using football as a platform. Uh, what kind of things are you excited most about or proud of most about when it came to building your brand that 20 years with the football uh, platform? Well, for me, uh, to me, in, in modern day society, one thing I look at, and I, you know, with a lot of speaking that I do to a lot of corporations and stuff, resiliency is, there, there's a cry for it right now. Yeah. We need to be a much more resilient society. And, and I know for me, that was the staple of my career that I wanted to hang my brand on is because, you know, regardless of all the obstacles of what it takes, because, you know, for a lot of people, even to start a podcast with all the information, because remember me, when I was growing up, I had to go to the library, write down everything. <laughs> yeah. Well, now you got, you got Google, you got all these different outlets uh, as far as online that you can go and achieve whatever you want to achieve is right there at your fingertips. But a lot of people are nervous as far as the work that comes with it, you know, mm -hmm. the challenges that might come with it, what people might think. But for me, it's all about you. And for me, it was about me because, yeah, as a quarterback, when people don't like you, they say all types of things about you. But where is your focus? And for me, it was all about overcoming those obstacles because if I didn't, you know, wasn't able to stand up and face, you know, those challenges, you know, during my 20-year career. Because, again, I was cut four times. I was cut by the Packers. I was cut by the Chicago Bears. You know, I came to Canada and, you know, again, I was cut by the Calgary Stampeders. I was mm. cut by the Hamilton Tiger Cats. But, again, I was able to still put in 20 years in a career. 
you know, was it, there, was it the lack of their patience? I don't know what it was, but the thing for me was I use it as a stepping stone for me because to me, when people said I couldn't, another log was on the fire. And so now, as long as that, lo- that fire was burning, and sometimes it was a rage fire, it was like a forest fire, as far as burning within me, you know, it applied to my life and allowed me to go out there and give it my all, whether it came to training, uh, training and to be stronger than any other guy that I was playing against. That includes defensive linemen and linebackers, so you can arm tackle me. To make sure I knew more than the secondary knew, I was 10 steps ahead of the, the opposing defensive coordinator, making sure I knew what his, his plan had been and the last time we played him, what, what was his process of calling? What was, you know, some patterns that I might be able to pick up on? To me, who was Waldo, that defensive back, the guy who's out there going to give everything away, whether it was man or zone or they're bringing the heat? I wanted to be 10 steps ahead of my opponents playing a game of chess. So it was all those things that I was able to learn from talking to the right people, surrounding myself with the five closest people to you who make you. I made sure it was people who could put me that much further ahead in life. And for me to be able to get through the 20 years, eating five, 6,000 calories a day to get to 225 finally, and to making sure at the age of 41, I could stiff arm people to the ground that were 22 years old, (laughs) but I could have been their dad and still be able to get out there and give it. But, you know, I want to make sure that now at this age, I can hand that baton off to the next generation. Mm -hmm. So therefore they might be able to run their race and even a heck of a lot more successful than I ever was as far as in my lifetime. Mm. So when you were in Calgary and you were coming up, when it came to attaching yourself with other brands, endorsements, what kind of things were going through your head then in terms of, yeah, I want to work with this brand. I don't want to work with this brand. Kind of explain your mindset back then, as opposed to your mindset right now being established. Uh, back then, I was just a hound dog. I was just out there jumping on anything that yeah. came at me that you threw it at me. And, and I, you know, of course, I had a couple of people in my corner that I would ask, but I was just intrigued just to get out and learn, learn, build knowledge, build that platform, build, build that know, know how to know what I wanted to do, you know, as far as in life, even though I knew I had this degree in communication, broadcasting and communications and had spent so much time working in business and doing different things, I wanted to find a way where I could attribute that and, and make that transferable, not only from the classroom, but as far as into regular life, where I think as life continued on and I, you know, involved myself in those experiences, investing in different areas as far as in life and in different industries and finding out what were the, you know, best bang for your buck as far as in, in the ROI return, you know, return on, on, on investment. Yeah. I was able to learn those throughout time as far as the places to be and the places not to be as far as what to surround my brand with. But I knew what my passion was and was all about being a part of media and helping build content that would be, uh, you know, to me, favorable to people being able to build and grow and to be a part of, because for me, I'm not only a person who wants to help share the help share content and help share the news, but for me, it's all about the entertainment value as well. Because for me, if you can't laugh in life and live life lightly, then what type of life are you living? Because life is too short to be too serious in life. And for me, the people that you impact along the way, to me, that's the wealth and the riches that you're able to be able to fulfill and have. So therefore it, it makes you immortal when, when you're dead and gone. And so, but over, over, over time in life, you know, attaching myself to different media brands, allow myself to be able to stay out there within the off seasons. And therefore, you know, you don't hear about Henry Bush just during the season. So even during the off season, you're thinking, man, he's doing this now he's doing that, man, this dude is everywhere. Yeah. And so the fact that I was able to continue to, keep my name as a repetition on a daily basis. It allowed me to become part of everybody's daily life and lifestyle. So whatever my name was attached to, it was automatically going to catch people's interest. And the biggest thing about that, you continue to produce on the field, which was the reason why you were allowed to do a lot of the things that you were able to do off the field. Mm -hmm. Uh, I feel as though today in today's age, and I even, uh, was kind of a victim to that. A lot of athletes want to do the off the field, want to have that off the field glory before putting in the work. Not so much putting in the work for the on the field glory, but mm-hmm. establishing that on the field glory. I always remember my, my rookie year, I used to you know, hop in the hot tub with, uh, with, with Michael Strahan to pick his brain. You know, when I was a rookie with the New York Giants, I always wanted to ask him questions. So anytime, I saw him, you know, going to hop in the hot tub or taking a walk all by himself. I used to run over there, you know, I ask him, uh, ask him questions. And he was always talking about, you know, I would always ask, hey, I want to model. I want to do TV. I want to do these things during my football career. But he always used to say, take care of the on the field first. And that's where I feel like I messed up when I played with the Dolphins. So what advice would you give to the new age athlete? Because now in 2023, college guys are going to be able to profit off their likeness. 
you know, we have social media. Guys are making all types of media off the field. So what advice would you give the new age athlete that's getting all these not only endorsement uh, opportunities thrown in their way, but now they see this opportunity to expand their brand uh, through their platform or whatever sport they play now? I think you summed it up perfectly by the fact that you approached a very successful big time name as far as in all of football and Michael Strahan and you yeah. asked him an important question. No question is a bad question. And I think that's where you gain the respect from your elders that much quicker, because if you're able to ask that difficult question and put yourself in a vulnerable position, that just shows just how humble you are, just the type of person that you are. Because a lot of people today have so much self-pride because, yeah, man, you know, I do this, I do that, I was drafted, I got this much money. Yeah. Well, trust me, that money can run out quick in yeah. today's world. That money can run out quick because there was a guy named, uh, was it P. Diddy, made his song, More Money, More Problems. And, yeah. and you know, sometimes you don't hear from people and all of a sudden you start hearing from them wanting to give out $5,000 loans all of a sudden on a drop of a hat. But the thing is, all that comes with it, all those pressures. You know, with, with great power comes great responsibility. And the thing is, how are you going to grow within that power? But you have to understand what your foundation is, what's mm. giving you this stage. It's the game of football. Mm. And the things that you do on the field can help lead to success off the field. Because I know for me as a quarterback, if I threw five interceptions in a game we lost, when I left the stadium, it was out in, in public, all I was going to hear about is, man, you need to get it right or you need to get your butt out of here. <laughs> and so for, for me, the thing was, I wanted to make sure people were were – I was transparent with people and they were transparent with me, but also the way I could build my transparency was by doing the right things. And for me, when I did the right things, had my focus in the right place, it usually equaled a great outcome. So for all those young kids coming up who are making the transition, whether it's from high school to college or more so from college to the pros, get, get home right. Home right, which leads to your work life, handle that. And then anything that extends beyond that, that is option number three, but get number one and number two correct before you start to focus on number three, because those first two, if you handle business there, it'll lead to success on that third level, which leads to business and future success. Mm. All right, so the football aspect of you officially done. You retired, well, we, we had the opportunity to walk away from the game. You walked into TV, kind of a new world. You were taking classes, like you said, but it's, 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 a, it's a pretty new world. What have been some of the obstacles through this new journey that you've had to deal with and use that resiliency that you talked about that you had, that you learned from football and coming up, when have you had to apply that to get better uh, as an on-camera TV personality? Well, I know for me, I was thrusted right into it uh, with morning shows. I was hosting right away and there were certain situations where I would have to host shows and do interviews all together by myself in the same situation, the same wow. day, same wow. broadcast. And so I was thrusted into that heat of the moment where, you know, I, 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 I could have, you know, pretty much turned into a raisin while on air. But my thing was, I, I just looked back into my bag. I was like, I've been here. You know what I mean? I've had these pressure packed moments where, you know, millions of people are watching you play in, in the biggest game, one of the biggest games on the planet being in the Grey Cup. I've been here. I, I've understood this moment. I, I know how to prepare for this moment. So why am I going to act like this moment is any different than a moment that I've been in? It hasn't. It's not a different moment. So therefore, I use everything that I have prepared for and that I experienced in the past just to prepare me for those moments. But the resiliency for me, the toughest part for me was after I retired of playing 20 years, I had to be a dad. You know, I had to be a husband because now my oldest was becoming a teenager. My youngest, he was getting into double digits. You know, my wife, I've been married to her for 15 years. And the first question she asked was when I was going to, when, when am I going to have my husband at home? So mm -hmm trying to figure out a way to be resilient and prepare, but yet find time to put in it with my family, knowing that I would do a show on Thursday transition on a flight to Toronto to start hosting football from Thursday to Sunday, flying back, back up at 3 a.m. on Monday morning. It was tough, but all in all, I knew I was doing this for my family. And even when I had to go watch my kids play sports at 8 p.m. and 9 p.m., sometimes 10 p.m., depending on what the sport was, and I would get home at 12 a.m., in the morning and wake up at 3 a.m. and do it all over again, I had to remain, I had to maintain that resiliency because I wanted to be the best at what I was doing, one. But number two, which is to me the most important thing, was that I had to spend that time with my family just so they knew that, hey, I have a dad. Hey, I have a husband. And so it was tough. But in order for me to do it all, I knew that in the end, it would benefit myself and my family because now it's helped me create that next chapter in life for occupation-wise and for us to maintain this lifestyle, but also 
Now I'm in a position where I can even spend more time with my family. And so I'm able, able to, to build those relationships at home and help shape my kids, my two boys, yep. to become great men and great gentlemen in the future. How do you balance it all? What type well, of, because a lot of successful people, they, they use Zen, they use meditation, or it's, they have a strict schedule. How does, how does Henry Burris balance it all? Well, I, I know I read, okay, you know, I, I, got, I got to get something straight here because I read all <laughs> these different postings of people saying, oh, if you want to be rich, you got to wake up at 5 a.m. You don't have to do that every day. So, <laughs> don't have to. Getting your sleep and staying healthy is the most important thing you need to do yeah. because without health, that'll bring your career, your, your success to a screeching halt. Yeah. Well, for me, number one is the fact that, that, like you mentioned, I maintain a healthy lifestyle. I work out all the time. And for me, majority of the time, I try to meditate twice a day. Uh, when I wake up, I go eat my breakfast, I read the news, I go back, I meditate. Then I get my day started, where at least I'm working out at least for an hour at least during the day, or I'll do a 45 minute, just, just back to back, bang it out type workout. But at, in that afternoon, it's either meditation or I take a nap. Like I have to do one or the other. And sometimes I meditate and I'm tired to the point where I end up taking a nap. But to me, <laughs> meditation, and gathering your thoughts and collectively condensing things because life can be crazy with so many thoughts that we have and we're mad people trying to create this trying to do that condense life make life as simple as it can be because you know what your calling is and until you get that calling down stick with that make sure you perfect that before you move on to step two to me trying to put the cares before the horse is the worst thing that we can do sometimes but the thing is for me it's having a schedule each and every day making that schedule out condensing life to make it as simple as possible and knowing what the most important things are. And when you schedule that lifestyle, make sure you focus it around them. Because for me, with kids that are as active as mine's are, if they have a sporting event on the weekend at four o'clock, then I got to adjust what my life is and make sure I can attend what they're doing. Because for me, that's the most important investment I can make today. Mm. Man, I, I mean, because one day I want to have family, you know, one day I, I want to have, I mean, I need to get a girlfriend first, you know, before I even get <laughs> talking about kids and all that. You just said, don't put the cart before the horse, but yeah, man. For, the sake, for the sake of conversation right now, yeah, I, I mean, I want a family, but at the same time, I'm just so not so much caught up i just love the hustle so much this yeah. game that i'm in right now when it comes to or i live in denver i do a tv show uh based out of denver but flying to new york on the weekends uh to do the stuff with the giants or even doing uh, uh, uh college football on saturdays i'm still at that point though where it's like yeah i want a family but i just love this lifestyle so much of just being so free to just get up and go and work on self, that sort of thing. And I mean, it's, it's great to hear that, you know, coming from, come from a, a guy like you, because I'm trying to think like, how am I going to do it? How am I going to do it? And I feel like I still have that selfishness in me right now where I still want Brandon London, you know, to, to be on the come up and not right. have to take a back seat. And it sounds selfish. I, don't, I wouldn't want to take a back seat to family right now. Does that make sense? But you're in that you're in that phase in life right now where you're a go getter. You're a go getter, and it's all yeah. about making the most of this time right now while you are single. Because you know every chapter in life has a shelf life. Yeah. Where when you had that injury back in 2012, you mentioned yeah. um, that that spoke to you in different ways. Because now, even though a part of you said, "Man, I wish I had continued on," once that injury occurred, you flipped that switch for a reason because you didn't want to experience that ever again. Like to me, getting injured was the worst thing possible. And I know for me, having an injury in the Grey Cup where my knee just buckled and gave away, but I still was able to come back after getting it shot up, it showed me that I don't want to deal with that anymore. And after taking a couple of hits in my last year, I was like, okay, I feel these hits now. But everything has a shelf life and different things will happen to where it'll get your attention. And it'll show you that, hey, maybe there's something missing in life, or maybe that's, this is enough of that. Or for you, hey, you're at that go-getter mentality uh, point of your life. Go get it right now because at some point you're going to be, you're, you're, you're going to be uh, experiencing something that, that is going to be touching for you. But you're going to experience something that's going to touch you even more where you're going to see somebody with their family who might be in the same industry that you are and see them at this point in life where they've been working around the clock, working hard, and you're going to see them. You're going to be like, you know what? I miss that. Or during your journey, you're going to have that one young lady walk up and say, hey, Mr. London. And you're going to be like, okay, London is open. And you know what? 
<laughs> and uh, and the thing is, different things happen in life for different reasons, and it's not one for us to say why. You just continue to live life, yeah. just pin your ears back, and, and and be a horse, man, running towards that finish line. Yeah. And at some point, something will get your attention along the way, and it will happen for a reason. But I love the way you're going about it in life, B. London, because, I mean, you're not focused on those things. You're letting it catch your focus during your journey. And that's how it's supposed to be, because when you try so hard to bring something in your life or integrate something in your life, it's usually going to not wind up so well, because you can't force things in this thing called life. It typically happens, because that's what human nature is all about. Yeah. And uh, during this uh, quarantine, you've actually started a podcast with your wife. Yeah. It's about family life. Tell me, tell me all about that. Cause you know, I'm, I'm logged into that right now. Just after you uh, telling me, you know, giving me the, the words of wisdom that you just gave me uh, a couple seconds ago. Well, we're, we're, we're almost uh, finishing up all of our works. We got our equipment on the way for both my wife and I, and I can't give the name out yet because we'll okay. I mean, do a big okay. splash with it. But you know, the, the beginning of May, uh, be on alert for that. And uh, we're going to get you on the show B London. And, uh, but my wife, Nicole, uh, Nicole, she played a, uh, lacrosse at temple she was an all-american lacrosse player and uh and you know her being a big time athlete myself playing athletics the level that i played and you know for both of us who we speak to different groups all the time you know we want to be those parents who've been there we've done it we've experienced because now it's a much different world that our kids are involved in there's a lot of capitalization dealing with single-minded sports approach compared to how parents need to feed their kids to how relationships and dealing with you know, a wife being in sports with uh, an athlete who, uh, you know, for myself, who was at the level that I was at, having to deal with all the goods and the bads about it and her being able to tell stories about that. We want to make sure we can relate to people that are living lives, having to deal with those obstacles, overcoming overcoming, and needing those questions answered that they may not know. Because, again, I've seen kids who feed – parents who feed their kids pizza and ice cream before a game and they're wondering why my kid just isn't giving it all and I'm like man don't you understand you can't feed your kids dairy and cheese pizza before a game? It really isn't uh, yeah. no one really, knows though no one yeah, knows people don't know so we're yeah. trying to educate people and can you please touch on the topic of helicopter parents oh 100 percent on that topic <laughs> <laughs> what? Okay. Hey, that's one of our first topics, actually. Lawnmower and helicopter parents. <laughs> oh, man, because I remember, I, I remember when uh, P. Diddy got in trouble uh, for beating up the strength coach at UCLA when his son Justin was there. I'm just looking at it like, wow. And that's nothing compared to the videos where you see parents fighting at t-ball games and and pop Warner games. So please, you please shame them. Shame them all. 100%. <laughs> <It won't happen. laughs> so I want to I want to uh, transition into quarterbacks. Talking nice. quarterbacks. All right. So during the past NFL football season, I think we had uh, four black quarterbacks playing in the playoffs, playing against each other. From when Henry Burris was coming up, obviously the challenges you faced uh, being a black quarterback coming up. How exciting was it for you to see? the amount of black quarterbacks that were playing in the NFL playoffs this past season. I'm loving it, man. I mean, you know, it's, it's all about everybody getting an opportunity. And yeah. that's the one thing I, I've always harped on. Cause I know for me, when I came out similar to what Jalen hurts is going through this year, first question I was asked, and I still remember a New York giant scout said, Hey, you want to play free safety? And I was like, hold up. Uh, your free safeties who play, you had a couple guys who played in the big East. I've uh, burnt those guys on, on daily, uh, you know, occasions. So Ooh. why would I want to play you know, <laughs> safety when I yeah. know how to burn those guys and manipulate them? But, you know, just to see that, you know, where things have came from, you know, from back in the day to uh, Bernie Custis to, to Joe Gillum, now to seeing Doug Williams to Warren Moon, now to seeing guys like Russell Wilson, you know, seeing Dak Prescott, seeing Deshaun Watson, seeing Patrick Mahomes, seeing all these guys, Lamar Jackson, <laughs> finally getting an opportunity to play the game that they have so much passion for and they're gifted. I mean, the gifts that they have to do the things that they're able to do, I mean, is insurmountable. You can't even measure the amount of heart that these guys have for them to be getting an opportunity to showcase their skills and their abilities. I'm loving every minute of it. And also to see a guy, you know, in my mind who, I mean, right now, I mean, should be on a team that being Jameis Winston, but to lead the league in passing as far as yards. And yeah, we know he had the interceptions and stuff, but Hey, Peyton Manning had the same situation as well. And, you know, you saw how his career went. So my thing is to see these guys, you know, being able to take the platform 
that I myself was able to build off of that other gentlemen built for me to see these guys continue to carry the torch moving forward. You can tell when it comes to African-American quarterbacks, we are well represented on that stage and to see these guys, I can't wait to see them this upcoming year and to see how well they continue to build on their platforms. Do you think that they have changed the game in the, in the, um, do you think that they've changed the game when it comes to the prototype of a quarterback now? Because nowadays, I just want to know when are we going to get to the point where we're just saying, hey, that guy is a good quarterback, not a good black quarterback, not a good white quarterback. When is that one? Do you think that the Lamar Jacksons, the Deshaun Watsons are turning that position into one prototype where it has to be a dual threat quarterback? Well, it's funny you ask that because there was a guy named Joe Montana who ran the wishbone at Notre Dame mm. and became somewhat of a great passing quarterback in the pros. Well, he was a runner before that. So the thing is, to me, that narrative has been in existence for way too long, and it needs to change ASAP because if a guy's a good quarterback, he's a good quarterback. But we knew with the game things change, and right now the statue quarterback, there's not a place for him unless you have a great offensive line, and you have to give that guy time, and then he can pick you apart. And so – my thing is the game has changed so much because the defensive lines and the defensive personnel are so good these days that if you can't make things happen from the pocket, you have to be able to extend plays. And so that's just a part of the game that the game has evolved into. And so these are just quarterbacks that are making adjustments. And so therefore that narrative has to change. And it doesn't matter what the color of your skin is because the Josh Allens of the world is, are, they're very athletic. They have yeah, big arms. They can make plays just like any so-called black quarterbacks, a white quarterback, but it don't matter. Mm -hmm. But the bottom line is you want quarterbacks that can win. They're tough enough to carry the weight of the world on their shoulders and they can deliver with accuracy and making great decisions on the field and being great leaders off the field. And that's what we have right now. These guys aren't in the media for the wrong reason. So let's give them their respect due and let's pay them their respects as quarterbacks because they're breaking down film just like the rest and they're delivering their teams to the playoffs just like the rest of successful quarterbacks in the history of the game are as well. And speaking of a successful quarterback in the history of football, Tom Brady, right now, 42 years old at the start of this season, he will be uh, 43 years old. At 41 years old, you, and I, I want to make sure I get this right, threw for 461 <laughs> yards, three TDs, including the game-winning touchdown in the Grey Cup, and you got Grey Cup MVP at 41 years old. What advice – would you give to Tom Brady, who's going to turn 43 years old in August? You know what? Despite all the experience that you have, despite all the accolades and the trophies that you, you have won prior to this moment, you know, as, as an elder statesman and for people to continue telling you that you are old, now it's time to reach into your goodie bag even deeper. Ooh. Expand your mind. Find ways to expand the horizon that you've been built because no matter who you're working with or how much experience they have, everybody brings something new to the table that can help expand your horizon as a quarterback. Because even though I had first year coordinators, my final two years, I learned so much from those two young men and so much from those two gentlemen that helped me become the best quarterback that I could ever be. And when I won, won my last championship, I walked off the field with my, with my chin held high and my head held high. And so now when I share all the experience with the younger quarterbacks that I'm working with now and all the things that I went through, making sure I kept my open mind, not a closed mind saying, do you know who I am? And, and, and accepting the fact that I'm humble and I want to continue to be humble and I want to continue to be a sponge, allow me to be the best that I could ever be when I hung up my shoulder pads and hung up those cleats. And Tom Brady is, is, is uh, capable of doing it more than anybody else. And the thing for him is just keep an open mind, Tom, work with Byron Leftwich. He's been there for a number of years work with you know work with the coaching staff it's a great coaching staff that's done some great things with other veteran quarterbacks in the past these guys are going to make you right you're in the right place that you need to be go in there with an open mind and seize the daytime hey represent for us old heads baby <laughs> <laughs> body body wise around that age were you listening to every ache and pain or were you still able to be like oh you know what that's just a sore shoulder i can i can work through that I found ways, you know, like I said, I, I turned to mobility, even though I was a strength worker and I know got, a lot of guys are doing band workouts now. I was still a guy who did a lot of Olympic style lifts, strength training, explosive stuff, deadlifts, hang cleans, power cleans. But I found a way just to make my body as mobile as possible. And I did a lot of mobility working because I know for me being not as much of a scrambler and more as a pocket quarterback, knowing how vicious these defensive linemen were these days, I was going to take a lot more hits and I had to prepare my body for 28 games 
more so than the 21 that we have to play to reach the Grey Cup. Yeah. So therefore, I prepared myself for those games, the overages, understanding the the, the, the damage my body is going to take and making sure I push my body to the brink more than I ever had before. And even during that final season, I took a lot of hits. I took some hits and said, okay, I haven't felt that before. <laughs> but I trusted the process and the fact that I put in the work and it's going to deliver me the same, I guess, experiences and the same, I guess, outcome that I've experienced in the past. And honestly, even though I did break a finger, at the end of the day, the rest of my body was still in one place and it delivered, it delivered the outcome that I was used to from the prior years that I had played the game. Man, I'll take a broken finger any day, man. <laughs> to be able to, to be able to walk away and just be like, oh, you know, it's a little funny looking, but you know. Uh, hey, Eric, go ahead and tell the people where they can find you on social media, man. And uh, it shows everything. Where can the people find Henry Burris? Well, just look for Henry Burris and Henry Burris One, uh, Henry Burris One on uh, on Instagram and Henry Burris on everything else from from uh, what is it? Uh, we have LinkedIn, Twitter. Facebook, Henry Burst is where you'll find me. And I'm always leaving videos and, and different quotes about motivating people because we need it more so than ever yes, we do. Uh, during this time of day. Absolutely, man. And I thank you for joining us. Thank you for dropping those gems. And good luck to you with everything that you have uh, coming up. Hey, be long to you too, man. Hey, keep delivering the daily word. And I love what you're doing, man. Keep it up. Appreciate it.